the day, I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the Center for Health Journalism at the University of Southern California. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, what we are calling a master class, a master class in reporting on health policy. This webinar is offered thanks to the generous grants from the Commonwealth Fund and the National Institute of Healthcare Management Foundation. Covering the healthcare beat can be a daunting task. There's the jargon, the challenge of keeping up with healthcare law while the current administration works to dismantle it. And then there is the perennial challenge of trying to humanize a topic that has such high stakes. We know Americans care deeply about their health care, about pre-existing conditions and drug prices. How can we best keep them informed? Here to help with this are two veteran health policy reporters, each with their own daily reporting challenges. Victoria Colliver is Politico Pro's California-based health care reporter whose job involves explaining California, dubbed the center of the resistance, to the rest of the nation. She's always on deadline for the fast-moving news site. To accomplish her job, she draws on more than 15 years of experience on the health beat at Politico and before that at the San Francisco Chronicle. Victoria was also a 2010 California Fellow at our center. Daniel Chang is a health reporter for the Miami Herald, the newspaper he grew up reading, and was the 2014 National Health Journalism Fellow at the Center for Health Journalism. He also serves on our center board. He has reported in both English and Spanish, and his health stories capture the inflections of Miami, from stories on the large elderly population to the ever-popular plastic surgery and its immigrant communities. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few operating procedures. We'll hear first from all of our speakers, then we'll open it up to your questions for the final 20 minutes. Because we have several hundred people participating in our webinars, we'll ask you to comment in the question field in your control panel, and we'll read out your questions. If you have technical challenges, please also communicate with us through the question or comment field in your control panel, and you can tweet about this webinar at the hashtag health reporting. Now we'll get underway. Victoria, it seems like every day is a challenge given your deadline pressures. How do you pull it off? What are your secrets? Yeah. Well, first off, I'd like to thank you, Michelle, and the center for having me here and for all of those who are listening. I really appreciate um, being able to talk about what I do, and I'd, I'd love to hear from many of you about what you do as well. So as Michelle mentioned, I, I was at the San Francisco Chronicle for about 15 years covering health, so that's a, a very long time. And I um, covered different aspects, like I was a medical reporter, I did um, uh, cover the, the business section, just all different types of things. Now I work at home for Politico for about the past year and a half. And just wanted to say, I, the main thing I miss, of course, is the newsroom, newsroom banter. So you have my info below. Anyone wants to share witty comments or just say hi, feel free. I appreciate that. So here I go on to side two. Um, is, is my... Um, I'm having a little too. So, I'm sorry. You're not advancing. You're still on. Use your arrow key, Victoria. I am using my arrow case. It's not. It's not working. So we're gonna um, just flip over, and we'll advance for you, and then just tell us next, and then we'll we'll get to the next slide. Okay, I have no explain. We we tested this and it didn't work. Okay, so we can move on to slide two, please. This will take us a moment here. Okay, we're there. We're there. Okay. Apologies for that snafu here. So I was just saying that when I moved to Politico, I was thought of a, a bit of a policy wonk at the Chronicle. 
And I realized I was completely outwonked by Politico in terms of the, the acronyms, learning the DC um, lingo. I'm based here in California, but almost the entire team is, is out in DC. Um, I started in January 2017 there for the beginning of repeal and replace. And I guess my first tip would be if you really want to, you know, just rev up your career, just change jobs after 15 years or pretend like you do. A lot of you have um, probably started more recently than I have. And it's just the whole, I thought people knew who I am, but this this time I really had to reach out to folks, reach out to people in a new policy area, new policy arena, do tons of meet and greets, um, send emails to have all these chit chats, a kind of typical uh, beat building that you do in the beginning of career. For, but for me, it was a really great jump start and it got me um, going and um, it really also helped re-energize me in a new area. I work for Politico and Politico Pro. The Pro side is uh, a subscription-based audience and they're pretty sophisticated. Um, they, they're not just individuals. Many of them are in the healthcare industry itself. They're lobbyists, they're um, uh, maybe healthcare attorneys, foundations, people who have a pretty deep knowledge of the industry and the policy. So my job is to both write for a very sophisticated audience and to, um, to write for a general audience. The, the pro side, you know, it, it just requires a higher level of detail. I try to describe it as like covering every burp and squeak of the, um, you know, of, of health policy in California. And I think of my audience as, say, some, uh, maybe like a health executive like in Minnesota, someone who is wondering, why do I care about this California story? What does this larger California story mean to me? And then, you know, very often I take stories that I write for that very specific audience and I rewrite them for our main site, which would make them more general and understandable to the rest of the world. That's our, our free, but I'm just explaining the difference because it's, it's writing for two masters, writing for two different types of audiences, and also dealing with the paywall, which many of you do. Um, I'm going to warning first, this is going to be a little bit legislative heavy because the session in California just ended on Friday. So I've been like knee deep in understand kind of going. Oakland, Sacramento's um, about a two hour train ride away. So I do have some challenges covering it from that perspective. So I thought I'd move on to slide three to discuss a bit about work process. Are we able to do that? Perfect. So, you know, usually I start my day um, going through a lot of emails. Um, I'm three hours behind my editors who are in DC. So that's always a bit. And I, I just look, this is just a smattering of, of sources. I'm sure you all have many that you use and look at. I look at it, um, a ton, I, re I read a ton of different newsletters. Everyone seems to have one. Um, all the major newspapers nationally. And I really rely on a lot of groups like Kaiser Health News um, that kind of puts together a morning briefing. Um, I uh, Political Pulse, I just have to um, uh, plug our daily newsletter. And then I also like, I use various different organizations, um, get, you know, getting their emails and, and click on them. I also follow, I, I just put down Louise Norris because I was, thinking about people who are in industry, or, um, not necessarily those that you would um, think of as like news, news people, but are great to follow because they, they know their industries really well. There's a bunch of them, I just put her down as an example. Um, and then I also have some local sources that I rely on. I'm moving to slide four, thanks so much. Um, you know, uh, these are some of the other things that kind of uh, help me keep my, tabs on what's happening in, in California. And I just put out another couple local blogs at the bottom, just to name a few. Um, I thought I'd um, point out the first one I have is Capital Morning Report. That's on slide five. We can move on to that one. It'll be slide five. 
Yeah, this is a subscription-based um, service that I'm, I'm not sure if other states have this available, but it's a site that um, helps, it tells you everything that's going on in the Capitol every day and whether it's um, what's happening in each legislative house, um, things like their, um, they tell me about uh, news conferences and, and various different things that go on. And I find that an invaluable source. Um, you can also go, of course, to the individual um, houses, you know, the assembly or the Senate and in your state or wherever you are and find out what's going on on a daily basis. But I find this is a, is a good kind of organizational tool. So I can go on to slide seven. Um, another thing I use a lot is, um, California Channel. This is an, you can also, I said, use your individual assembly or state sites that help, you know, get, keep track of what's going on. But the thing I like about this is it's a it's it it live streams like the assembly and the Senate and it's all in one place. It'll give me agendas going on every day. And I basically what I do is I in the morning I kind of put together what I need to watch what's you know what's happening some days there's absolutely nothing and that's um fine i'm working on other types of stories and i don't but other days it is just constantly i keep it on in the background of 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 what i'm doing eight Oh, this is fine. Legislative information. I also want to, this is like I said, a little bit legislative heavy, but one of the things I like to do is, um, is, is, is keep track, like in the beginning of the session, I try to figure out like, what are the major themes the legislature in California is going to take on that year? And I actually go through the bill. Sometimes I even do word searches and I put together a document of a bunch of bills that I think um, might rise to the top. And of course, throughout the session, more things are being introduced. So I'm adding and changing. And then I use other sources like um, advocates and um, what seems to have the buzz. And I try to keep a, a, a handle on, you know, what, what bills are important and why they're important. And I, you know, talk to the authors and try to get a sense of how um, how they're faring. I, for, for political, for example, there's some hot topics that I, I really been dealing with. Last year, it was, it was all about like single payer and pushing about back against the Trump administration. This year was also about pushing back against the Trump administration. We had some efforts early on in the year, like covering everyone, regardless of, of immigrant status and doing things like, um, they had a, earlier, we had a, a really, a bill that got a lot of attention for you know, allow the state to set rates for for medical services and things like that and that got a lot of buzz some of those crashed and burned early on but we still had some general themes about um you know what what made california stand out as a new sort i mean as a as a source of news that would resonate once again with my health executive back in minnesota like why he would care and then I thought I'd give you a, a lastly an example of just something that happened recently. Um, this would be slide eight. So a year ago, actually several couple years ago, a lawmaker had introduced a bill that would allow safe injection or supervised injection sites um, to be piloted in California. And this is a really interesting concept because a lot of different states um, and actually specifically cities have been trying to do this. And then, you know, they constantly butt up against the fact that this is illegal under federal law and potentially could subject folks to criminal, criminal prosecution. So there was this bill last year that I was really interested in um, and it got all the way to one of its final votes and it didn't have the vote. So it got shelved. And I, throughout the year, I would pepper the, author, the author's office and say, hey, what's happening with that bill? And then finally, just like a, two, two weeks ago or so, I noticed it was back on the agenda. And it was back on the agenda just kind of quietly on a Sunday when I was reading through what my agenda was for Monday. So the next morning, I 
get on the horn and I call the authors and the co-authors, try to find out what, what was happening with it. And I could tell that it, instead of, first off, it was like a statewide thing. Then it was nine counties last year. It got, and then this year, this last version was just one county, San Francisco. So I interviewed everyone in advance and I, I kind of write up a pre-write of while I'm watching the, the this finally came up for a vote. Have it ready to go and I put in a quote or two and and once it passed I just hit sent sent it to my editors and these are called whiteboards and they go up really quickly but it doesn't give this this is once again it doesn't give a whole lot of context so the just right afterwards I can go to the my final slide to show what happened with this is quickly things kind of escalated we had San Francisco piloting his own safe supervised ingestion site in the city at the same time that the deputy attorney general for the United States wrote an op-ed in the New York Times basically saying that he was going to vigorously prosecute any city that tries to do this. So in my final slide, I'll show um, slide nine. Um, basically that we could, I, I use my with my colleagues I had a colleague in New York and a colleague in DC, and we very quickly could take my reporting. I did some additional reporting. They did some reporting. We tied that together and quickly pulled together a pretty smart story, um, weaving in all those elements. The the fact that California has just passed this um, law, it's going to the governor's, and I shouldn't say law, passed this bill that's going to the governor's desk. Um, San Francisco had a safe injection site um, demo and all the efforts that were going on nationally to push back against it or to try to make it happen. And, and there you have it. So anyway, that's a very quick rundown. I wanted to leave some, um, I want to pass it over to my you know, colleague, Daniel Chang and, Chang, and then we'll have questions later. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Victoria, and uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Dan Chang, and I've been reporting on healthcare for the Miami Herald for five years now. Uh, it's not uh, not as long as Victoria, but it's long enough to have seen some pretty big things down here, and chief among them is probably the rollout of the Affordable Care Act uh, insurance exchanges. Uh, but I also feel lucky to work in a pretty fascinating and competitive place for healthcare. We, we really have a lot here. Um, uh, lots of retirees who rely on Medicare, as uh, Michelle mentioned in her introduction, and uh, one of the nation's highest rates of uninsured people. And, uh, not coincidentally, the country's biggest take up on the Affordable Care Act uh, exchange enrollment. Uh, we're also kind of notorious for rampant healthcare fraud and, um, you know, the Godzilla of infectious diseases in 2016, which was Zika. We were the first place to have it. Um, dubious distinction there. So uh, a little bit about the Herald. You know, we're a pretty old-fashioned newspaper. Our priority is and has been to break news and hold people and institutions to account and to serve as a watchdog for the community. And uh, our healthcare coverage really is not very different from that. You know, we look for stories that reflect our community, uh, that enlighten and inform. And uh, like lots of uh, regional dailies around the country, we have to make hard choices about what to cover and how to use our resources. But I, I feel uh, in, in the, the 18 years that I've been working at the Herald that we've always been guided by our principles and, and certainly we're committed to reporting the information that our readers Personally, my favorite type of report information that others don't want. Either. And a lot of this may be kind of old, but um, I thought it could be helpful to, to others. So uh, this is a day in the I'd start by uh, sort of describing my, my morning routine and I try to follow and honestly, I, I can't overstate this small ritual. You know, if you do it right and you mind the trusted sources, uh, each morning you'll find out what you might have missed or overlooked the day before, what's coming ahead that you hadn't expected, and 
what story ideas to pursue for the day or the week or the long haul project, right? So if you perfect this routine, I think over time, story ideas will begin to materialize and trends and overarching themes in healthcare will sort of reveal themselves and your coverage is going to benefit immensely. And if by chance you have a bad day, you blow a deadline or you get beat on a story or you have to write a correction, you know, you have this familiar and trusted routine that's going to be there waiting for you the next morning to offer you some encouragement and another chance to do better. So, you know, uh, when I, 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 I you know, I, I like to look for local sources and, and also ones with national perspective. And some of these uh, uh, Victoria has mentioned, and, and it's because they're good and they're thorough and, and they're authoritative. Um, and then, you know, there's also a, a, a sort of the old fashioned stuff that you really can't duplicate with social media and, and the Internet, like picking up the phone and. You know, you ought to make it a habit to talk to your sources on a regular basis and to find new ones and, and to even cold call others. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really something that uh, will kind of keep you on your toes, I think. Um, you know, so I, I, I try to follow my local hospital administrators, doctors, nurses, patient advocates, and others. And I've even found, as Victoria said, uh, everybody does newsletters, including law firms that focus on healthcare. I found them to be helpful sometimes. And I think that a, a similar strategy works for national perspectives too, right? I like to follow uh, healthcare economists on Twitter who, who are particularly insightful and reporters who are very good at their craft. Uh, Austin Fracht is a, a healthcare economist who does great. He writes often in the New York Times. Nicholas Bagley is a, a great healthcare attorney and economist. Uh, Amitabh Chandra with uh, uh, the, uh, the Harvard University and uh, Atul Gawande, who recently was hired to lead up the, uh, the new Berkshire Amazon uh, uh, J.P. Morgan uh, Health Triumvirate. I think Dan Diamond of Politico is, does a wonderful job, and his political his uh, podcasts are really informative. Uh, Sarah Cliff of Vox uh, is just a stellar reporter. Julie Robner of, of Kaiser Health News. You guys probably know about a lot of these folks already, but if you don't, you really ought to make a point to try to get familiar with their work. And, um, you know, a lot of folks write blogs, too, because uh, it's so easy, maybe in part. But I think that, you know, if, if you search and you ask, you might find that your local hospital's uh, PR department may uh, keep a blog. Uh, certainly your local academic medical center or their affiliated university uh, down here. The University of Miami's PR team does a good job of posting news about uh, not just new hires, but clinical research, prestigious grants, and, and other sort of new information on a regular basis that uh, helps you to feel plugged in. And uh, uh, your local college or your university medical school may do this too. And certainly the Center for Health Journalism is a magnificent resource, I think, for reporters, as is the Association for Healthcare Journalists, uh, which you, you ought to look into if, if, if you haven't already. I think they provide something that few other sources do, which is really a community of fellow journalists who are dedicated to covering healthcare, and 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 these folks are generous. You know, they share their knowledge and their experience, and and they do it for your benefit. So I, I think you ought to uh, look into those sources if you haven't. Um, so uh, the other uh, uh, topic that I thought would be helpful is and something that every reporter on every beat probably has to encounter, which is how do I find the right source, right? And and I think that uh, um, on, on a daily basis, you should be uh, asking your question, uh, this question uh, for your stories, right? And uh, one of the, the ways to begin to narrow that search down is, is to figure out, well, what is it that you want to do? You know, uh, you'll want different sources for different reasons. So you might want one to illustrate a policy impact or one who will provide expert perspective or a good quote on a on a topic or something much more traditional like the subject of a healthcare related news event. Uh, so as a reporter, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's imperative for you to keep lists. And, and uh, I guess in the old days there were Rolodexes and these days there may be the contact uh, section of your, of your email. Um, but, you know, you're going to meet a lot of people through your daily work if you're doing it right when you're going out there and uh, uh, meeting folks. And there are going to be patients, there are going to be doctors and nurses, there are going to be legislators on the local and state level. They're going to be advocates, and certainly there's never-ending shortage of PR folks pitching everything from uh, medical devices and uh, pharmaceuticals, wearable fitness technology, and uh, experts who, who write books, right? So keep track of these folks. Uh, do it in an Excel spreadsheet and organize them by subject relevance. You, know, you don't need to do much more than that. A name, a number, an email address. 
probably a brief sentence that helps you connect them to a specific topic or, or a hospital or, or a prescription drug or insurance plan. Um, and you'll see that over time, this list is going to grow and it's going to become as, as, as indispensable as your notebook. Our open calls. And uh, we used to subscribe to a service called Public Insight Network, which is a service from American public media that would sort of solicit readers and organize them by expertise and, and, and experience. And we could tap that to find folks. Uh, I remember us using this early on in 2014 when the uh, Affordable Care Act exchanges rolled out to find consumers and, and others to find out how, you know, how was their experience using their new insurance coverage. So, uh, but over time, you know, we started doing this ourselves through social media, posting uh, calls on Twitter or the Herald's Facebook page. Uh, I bet most newspapers these days have Facebook pages and us other times by more traditional means, like adding a note at the end of your story that says something like, you know, if you're uh, an uh, Obamacare consumer and you're worried about affording the health care when you need it, uh, tell us and you can contact us at this email address or call this phone number and and uh, that, that works surprisingly well, too. Um, and though sometimes, you know, uh, you, you, like I said, breaking news, you need a source right away, uh, right? And your, spread, your Excel spreadsheet might come up empty and your social media searches are running into dead ends. And you need to, to turn to more traditional resources, right? First responders like police and fire, or the public affairs folks at the hospital. And they can help you during a disaster. We've had a couple um, this year here in South Florida, bridge collapse. Uh, Sorry, a school shooting, um, and more common down here, uh, patients who die after these liposuction and fat transfer surgeries at outpatient office clinics, which happens a lot down here. Uh, and and uh, you know, you, you really want to uh, excel, or, or, or you want to understand the areas uh, of healthcare that your community excels in, be they good or bad, and, and why, because. Uh, um, it's your responsibility, and, and I think that readers will turn to you for that information. Uh, and then there's your reporting. You know, don't overlook the importance of the reputation that you build in the community through your own storytelling. You know, people are reading your stories, even if sometimes it feels like you're you know, like they're not, and you're maybe shouting into the wind. But some of my best stories have come from people who contacted me after reading a story that I wrote. And, uh, one example of that is uh, a couple who lives down here in South Florida who wrote to me after I'd written a story about uh, President Trump's decision to cancel the cost sharing reduction payments for uh, insurers who sell plans on the Affordable Care Act exchange. And, uh, you know, that turned out to be actually a, a benefit for, for the folks who receive the subsidies. But for those who buy their own health insurance and uh, had to pay for it all out of pocket there they were getting crushed by these rising premiums and and uh, I you know it's, it's really what that's one of the biggest challenges I think of the Affordable Care Act and one of the most sort of profoundly unfair parts of it and it comes up a lot in debate so I thought that was really useful and these are the writers um, uh, you know a picture of them at their kitchen table going over all of their bills and the different insurance plans that they that they uh, sort of sorted through uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that story got a lot of mileage. Uh, I, I don't know about uh, the newsrooms or the different folks who are on the call here, but, you know, at the Herald, we, we use Chartbeat, which is a sort of click tracking service, uh, if you will. It monitors which stories are, are doing well and which ones are not. And if, you know, Matt Drudge picks up one of your stories, then, you know, your day gets that much better because suddenly all this traffic just starts flowing into into your story. This particular story got about 100,000 clicks, which by our standard is pretty good uh, and especially when it comes to health care you know because it's not as sexy as uh, you know a big shootout or you know, as a regional daily is to sort of help localize big national stories like how does what's happening in Washington DC or even you know regionally how, how does it affect me right and I, I feel like I might be a little bit spoiled working in Miami because chances are that if there's a big healthcare story happening on the national level there's probably a South Florida angle or connection um, but if you don't work for a regional daily and and, and even if you do you're going to need to sort of pick your poison or you're going to spread yourself too thin, right? And healthcare is a big topic and it touches people across all walks of life. And you're not going to be able to tell all of it. So you have to spend some time 
as I said, learning about what's important in your community. What does your community excel at? And, you know, is it chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension? Is it obesity? Um, maybe it's access to care in a rural community, uh, affordability, physician shortages, opioid addiction. Um, you know, you, you really ought to pick the most important ones in your community and make it your business to learn everything you can about them. You know, speak to the people who are affected by these issues, not just the patients, but their families too. Interview those people who are on the front lines, social workers, uh, EMTs, teachers, local legislators, uh, certainly doctors and healthcare providers. And, uh, and you're going to want to choose your battles too. You know, as Victoria mentioned, uh, uh, Politico covers, uh, I think she said every hiccup and burp, right? But, you know, with big policy stories, there's often incremental developments. And um, for the Herald's readers, the chances are that they're not following those issues that closely the way that a lobbyist might. Uh, uh, so, you know, our readers are curious about how a policy change is going to affect them personally, right? They're looking to see themselves and their experiences reflected on our pages. And often that can mean consumer issues like uh, balanced billing or surprise medical bills. Uh, that's getting a lot of attention right now. And I don't know if you all saw an excellent story in Kaiser Health News by Chad Terhune. It was about a, a Texas school teacher who was charged more than twice his annual salary by a hospital that treated him for a heart attack, which is just outrageous on its face. And this was just after his insurance company had already paid the hospital like $50,000 for the episode, right? So this has been going on for a long time now. And, uh, you know, we started hearing about this from consumers about two years ago as patients began to use their Affordable Care Act plans. And a lot of them discovered the meaning of narrow networks for the first time, you know, and, and you can find these stories, too, in a lot of ways. Uh, you should familiarize yourself with the coverage and the plans that are sold on the exchange in your area. You know, I can tell you that in South Florida, insurers stopped offering uh, PPOs or provide pre preferred provider organizations, which typically have broader networks and cover some portion of out-of-network visits. And after the first year, uh, you know, uh, those plans were gone. And now all we have are EPOs, which are exclusive provider organizations, which are pretty narrow and don't cover any out-of-network visits, and, and HMOs. Uh, which, uh, which, which operate very similarly, but tend to have broader networks. And, you know, if, if you don't hear from readers necessarily about what they're encountering, I, I think that, uh, you know, you can use other methods to localize big stories you're reading about in your morning news feed. You know, uh, for balanced billing, if, if you're wondering if it's happening in your community, you can search your local clerk of court's civil case database, right? You can see, or if you have to go to the courthouse uh, personally and, and search and see, are, are there hospitals or physician groups who are, are growing as, uh, as uh, you know, are there lots of suits filed with them as plaintiffs? And, and you should understand the issue, too, about why it happens. You know, uh, uh, it tends to happen mostly with. You should also talk with your local legal aid office. I found them to be really helpful because sometimes when people are struggling with debt collectors and they don't have the resources to pay them and they don't know what to do, they do turn to legal aid offices for help. And uh, you should also talk to your state and local legislators because people turn to them too for help. You know, if, they're, uh, if, if the constituents are calling them and, and complaining about this issue, they'll, they'll probably share that with you. And maybe they'll even tell you about a legislation they're considering that would protect their constituents. And, you know, you could also ask your local hospital if they have a if they have a government affairs liaison, right? What are their legislative priorities? What are they working on? What's important to them that's happening in the state capitol that they really want to see happen? And, you know, this, this will give you clues to the issues that matter to them, and they could very likely be related to what's happening on the national level. And look, if it matters to them, there's a good chance it's going to matter to your readers, too. Uh, this is a the next slide is a story that we wrote. Uh, that I mentioned we got a, a call from a reader in Delray Beach who uh, basically followed his doctor's orders just like everybody else, right? Uh, referred for his heart condition, goes to the hospital, they're in his network, and surprise, uh, you know, the $15,000 bill comes from an out of network provider who was an anesthesiologist. And, um, uh, you know, these kinds of stories that, that, that sort of lots of people encounter that have this sort of sense of outrage and, and even some confusion about how can this be happening in healthcare? I already pay my premiums and I have my deductibles and 
you know, um, if the, the better you understand those things, and I, I think the better you will be at coming up with story ideas that really resonate with readers. And, um, you know, that was kind of the, the end of my presentation. So I'm looking forward to any questions that you all might have. And um, uh, I'll hand it back to Michelle. We still on here? Daniel, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, Michelle. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, uh, and folks, I do want to apologize for our share of technical challenges on this webinar. So, um, what I said is, if you have a question. Uh, please go ahead and send it through the control panel, and we'll go ahead and ask as many of those questions as we can. And I wanted to start out uh, with a question that you all both touched upon. You have such uh, distinctive areas that you're trying to uh, represent, um, Florida and Miami in particular, such a unique place, uh, Daniel, and Victoria, California, too. And I would argue that healthcare, even though we're guided by federal law, is so much of a local story. And I'm wondering how you recommend to reporters to get to know what is distinctive in your community and then go about really surfacing those those stories. Well, I, I can, um, if I can jump in here real quick. One of the things that I wanted to mention and, and forgot to in, in my presentation is that there are folks who are trying to figure out the answers to these questions in your community, and uh, they tend to be nonprofit hospitals. You know, under the Affordable Care Act, every nonprofit hospital was required to produce what's called a community health needs assessment, and uh, the acronym folks call it a China for. is facing. So, for instance, our big local public hospital, which is one of the biggest in the country, it's called Jackson Memorial Hospital slash Jackson Health System. They understand that one of the big challenges in our community, because we have a lot of folks who are low income and that's due to our economy, our sort of our economic structure. There's a lot of jobs that don't really offer health care insurance. A lot of folks are struggling with access to health care and they're either uninsured or underinsured. And they have to come up with strategies to address these issues. You know, diabetes and hypertension are also uh, pretty common chronic conditions in our community. And, and you can learn about what your, you know, A, what, what those issues are and B, how your, uh, how your local hospital or healthcare system is addressing those uh, through these reports. Um, uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, you also want to talk to, to the advocates who are out there. Uh, they tend to, you know, they tend to have their eye on the big picture and, and how what happens in, in our case in Tallahassee and also in Washington, D.C. or in the White House is going to affect folks. So Miami has a lot of immigrants one of the biggest immigrant communities in the country. And uh, one of the issues that, that uh, our local advocates are worried about that will affect them is uh, these draft rules for public charge, which if you're not familiar with those, it's essentially, uh, there, there, there's a, it's, it's a rule that says that if you rely on certain public benefits, uh, uh, the United States can deny your citizenship application. And uh, for a lot of folks, that's really important. And, and what, the, what the draft rule is proposing to do is to expand what's defined as a public benefit. Currently, it's cash assistance or long-term care, and then we're going to expand it to food stamps, to Medicaid, and to other forms of public benefit, uh, public assistance that traditionally hadn't been uh, used by folks. So if you're an immigrant household and your child was born in the U.S. and they qualify for Medicaid, you might want to disenroll your child from Medicaid, which is really critically important for that child's health, because you're worried that it's going to affect your, your citizenship status. So um, that's just one example. There are really many, and um, I hope that helps to answer the question. Yeah, I, I agree with much of uh, what Dan said, of course. Um, I also look at like my area as like whether we're driving the conversation or responding to the conversation. That's how I jump into the national debate over such issues, whether it's like opioids is a, is a national discussion, for example, well, what's California doing on that? It may not be driving the conversation on that, but it has, it might be in different ways and re in responding and treatment. Um, and then I also look at um, other things that we're right in the middle of, like immigration and covering health for all. 
and 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 what else is going on in your state for example in california we have a governor's election that could change things going forward so a lot of my, what i try to do is is cut above the noise um talk to all those people that daniel was just he was talking about our great sources and and really try to say what is it that my region um like earlier he said excels or just stands out on um and that that helps me uh, map how i look at where we fit into these larger discussions. So we have um, two questions from Carrie Klein. Um, they're both interesting, so um, I'll go ahead and share them. Her first question was uh, the kind of daily routine that you talked about, Daniel. Do you do that anyway, even if you know you have a deadline looming or a breaking story to jump on? Is that like a religion? And then her second question was <laughs> um, a lot of news outlets have been jumping on the Tell us about your outrageous medical bills ban. Okay. Well, look. Uh, the first question, I, 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 I'm, I'm not very uh, religious personally, but I do try to follow this routine as, as often as I can. And, uh, you know, our deadlines are no longer, you know, at the four or five p.m. They're, they're they're rolling they're all the time so if i'm not working on something that needs to be you know posted to online right away i do try to do this and sometimes you have to fit it in at other times of the day but uh i i just you know i use the morning because it's almost like making your bed you know it's this this this, this thing that if you get into doing every day it gives you encouragement and gives you comfort and, and it, it just you know as a healthcare reporter I, you will start to see the difference uh uh in in if you follow these uh these sources and make sure that you're keeping yourself informed um in terms of the share your medical bills yes it is being overdone look i have my own thoughts on price transparency i feel like it can work for certain things, mostly for standardized types of care, an MRI, uh, uh, you know, a, a particular uh, a particular test like a blood test. But when you're going in for a surgery or something, you know, uh, if one hospital, uh, you know, has a 20% the discount on appendectomies, you're not going to go there for it, right? So it doesn't work like traditional pricing. Um, but uh, you know, I, I can also see the need for it, and and this is what kind of tears at me a little bit because a lot of folks have much more uh, financial responsibility now, right? High deductible plans, co-insurance and co-payments. But, you know, you're going to go typically where your doctor refers you to go. And oftentimes, uh, you know, the hospital that is chosen is in your network uh, uh, is the one that you're going to choose if you have a if you have an option. And, and that story that I referenced in Kaiser Health News, uh, that was not, I believe, an in-network hospital for that patient. And it was just the closest one to his house, which tells you a little something about how health insurance uh, companies uh, 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 sort of craft their provider networks. Um, hospital bills tend to sort of spark a lot of outrage. Um, and, you know, it's important to understand how they work. Uh, but, you know, I, I just wonder how much folks really look at it. And, and I would say that maybe you want to look at the counter, which is why isn't there more information about healthcare quality? Why don't you know about how many particular types of, let's use appendectomy again, how many appendectomies does that doctor perform a week, a month, a year? You know, typically practice makes perfect and you want to know how many times, uh, you know, how often does that, uh, does that doctor perform these surgeries? You want to go to the one who performs them the most and who has good outcomes. Outcomes is another type of information that is not readily available. And I would argue that it's as important, if not more important, than price. So um, I hope that answers your question. Victoria, did you want to weigh in on, on either of these? Um, no, I think Daniel covered that pretty well. So are, are there additional questions that we have to tackle? Yes, yes. So uh, Daniel Abril, I'm sorry, Danielle Abril asks, I'm a business reporter who will be taking on the healthcare beat soon with no prior experience on that beat, not having a background in this, how do you catch up on policy and the complicated issues in order to effectively push the narrative forward? Well, I can jump in on that too, because I, when I started covering healthcare, my first um, my first step into it was as a business reporter. And it, it, it
by one day things I got, you know, okay for my editors to to zip over and we're places where you can get a lot of people in one room where you can introduce yourself quickly get a few um overviews i remember one that i did was on it, it, it did a lot about um the industry of healthcare. it was focused on that and i made connections that really helped me um get a foothold in into some of these complicated issues about um managed care and and pricing and um a first story i did i remember having to do with a um a contract negotiation in which people were actually were cut off from their um care in in that and that's since been dealt with and i think i don't think they can do that legally in california anymore but point being um you know just w once you start down that path you'll start you know, you have to talk to such and such and such and such. Um, and, and to me, that was, it was really helpful um, to, to have like a few gurus. And I also had some financial analysts who I, I got to know, they were like consultants for hospitals and things like that. One of whom has never, I don't maybe once he appeared in one of my stories, but I called him like a lot. And he talked me through some of the really nitty gritty, sticky stuff in, in contracting and all that. Um, just to have those people behind the scenes that they know when you call, they're not necessarily just calling to being in a story. They're just, you're just running things by them and they feel very much like part of helping to um, shape your understanding, a bit of responsibility in that. And um, those are people to this day that I still contact and talk to on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. Um, well, Danielle, I, I would say that uh, I, I I I was in a similar experience as you. I I sort of uh, I, I think uh, Victoria's word daunting is is true. I, I think I went into it more like kicking and screaming. I, I really didn't want to cover healthcare because I didn't know anything about it, and I was really intimidated by it. And my editors uh, kind of tricked me into covering it by saying, "Well, just try it for a little while and we'll see how you what you think." And I was like, "All right, all right, I'll do it." And, um, you know, one of the things that I found was really helpful, uh, if, if there's somebody who's been covering healthcare in your newsroom and you're going to take over that beat, um, you know, pick that person's brain, find out from them what's, uh, you know, what are the topics, what are the issues that they've been covering. I would also use your business background. You know, hospital finances are a good way to start understanding healthcare. You know, what are their sources of income? Learn about public uh, health insurance programs like Medicaid and Medicare. I promise you, you won't regret it. And it can be really dense and, and kind of policy heavy. But once you start to understand it, you'll start to understand a little bit better about healthcare. You'll start to understand about the differences between nonprofits, uh, for profits, and tax exempt hospitals. Uh, uh, or tax supported hospitals you'll understand about uh, you know sort of battles between insurance companies and hospital systems and and certainly as you report more about these things you'll you'll hear from readers too and i think that you also kind of like you know it's we all learn in different ways so one of the ways that i learn is kind of the the immersion uh uh, uh process you know I tried to immerse myself into as much as I could and even if I wasn't really understanding everything that was going on or I was seeing and looking at some point it starts to make sense to you or to me anyway so you know know, know what kind of a learner you are and, and try to use that method to, to understand healthcare um, and certainly you know look join the Center for Health Journalism join the Association of Healthcare Journalists you're going to see what Those are my tips. So we have a question from uh, Margaret Nicholas, who says, for either or both speakers, a lot of public health news is about being proactive and using preventive approaches. What tips do you have for pitching stories about the adverse event that has not happened yet, or do you advise not pitching such stories? <laughs> I always call that like the, the least sexy stories are the stuff that doesn't happen, right? Yeah, <laughs> but it, it is really important. Um, my thing is, preventive stories are, to me, they're they're worth their weight, especially when they have numbers behind them. Like, um, like for example, a hospital that institutes a really intense sepsis reduction programs. I remember doing stories on that, where you do have some comparison. That really makes it a little bit more sexy. But um, some of those prevention stories are a hard sell, I have to admit. Um, so it's a matter of, uh, of finding ways to illustrate um, that thing that doesn't happen and what that looks like. 
Um, Dan, did you have any additional ideas on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, population health, as, as some folks call it, is, is it can be interesting. It can be a little bit boring, but I think that you want to look at either the ironies or the counter trends, if you will. So, you know, I always get a kick when I hear hospital administrators say, hey, we want to keep people healthy and out of our hospital. And my question is, well, how are you going to make any money doing that? And um, you start to, you, 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 you sort of pull the thread on that question and you realize that, hey, they're putting more uh, resources into prevention. And, and, you know, what are the types of chronic conditions or health conditions that, that they're trying to prevent people from getting? And, and, and how are they going to make money from that? Um, look, you know, the other thing I would think about, too, is that uh, the, when I was talking about counter trend is that lots, uh, lots of our healthcare system has really been reactive and, and, and prevention is about being proactive right and, and so there might be something to to look at there that that those are ways to draw readers into a story that that may not be that sexy and 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 that you know tends to try to complicate co contemplate excuse me the, the the thing that hasn't happened yet but um once you understand why there's a big push for it um i, I think that'll give you something to to consider and and to write about uh, uh, as well so i hope that helps we have a question from Julie Schoenman who asks, what advice do you have for researchers who want to amplify the impact of their work through collaborations with journalists, and what could funders of research do to build stronger relationships between the journalism and research communities? Well, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer the question about collaboration because there's always the the sort of journalistic ethics that you you, you want to be sort of the um, uh, uh, the the. Uh, the, the, you don't want to be part of the story, you know, you want to tell the story. Um, but I think that one way that research, researchers can help broaden the impact of, of the work that they do is, is to sort of get right to the point. And, and sometimes that's not easy because science is complicated. And sometimes, you know, you need to prove the things that lots of folks uh, may take for granted. I think establishing a relationship with the reporter or a media outlet uh, about the work that you're doing, giving them the big picture, explaining to them why it matters. Or that kind of thing. So sometimes that type of candy works as well. Um, and the other thought is that uh, I, I see a lot of sort of fellowships and, and sort of weekend programs to help journalists learn more about research and, and the impacts of it and how to report on it responsibly and authoritatively. And I think that uh, um, trying to do that, even if it's not a weekend program. Maybe it's just a one-on-one -on -one lunch or coffee with a reporter to, to sort of help them understand the importance of what you're doing and why it matters. I mean, that would work for me. Mm -hmm. so. I covered the, um, the medical science aspect of um, healthcare reporting for a while, and I found some really good stories when I knew researchers worked with, you know, kind of talked to them for a while at, at institutions I cared about with. And they told me early on about it, like when it would be ready to public. And I worked kind of in advance. I was given either access to um, patients, which some cases that can, you know, they do the clearance and all that. You got the patients who participated. You you can put together a pretty uh, full story using all that um, material and, and also being first in it. So when I got that exclusive first option and then was, able to in advance to to really tell that story of the research i, I you know I, I think that produced some really good stories so uh julie kokenderfer asked and i can answer this question uh she said the association of healthcare journalists was mentioned by daniel what was the other organization mentioned and that was our own the center for health journalism and if i can just uh share with you briefly some of the resources that we have in addition to the webinars on health policy such as this one if you go to centerforhealthjournalism.org you'll find a host of blogs some written by journalists and some written by policy folks and we also offer fellowships for health reporters uh, a whole host of them we're about to um, Actually, tomorrow is the closing date for applications uh, for reporters all over the country to apply to our health data reporting fellowship. 
if you're accepted into these programs, you get um, about a week of training and you also receive reporting stipends and six months of mentoring. So um, it's just something I encourage you to take a look at in addition to our webinars. Um, I wanted to turn to a question that's kind of the flip side of the coin of the, the, the question a moment ago, and this is from Ginny Monk, and she says, do either of you have tips for reading and understanding medical journals and papers? It actually scared me the moment I was like reading through a medical journal and understood it, you know, like it was almost like I thought I'd gone a little too into um, the subject matter. But um, I think that that's always a challenge. And it I think the trick is to getting researchers who can explain things to you in, in English or have their um, media people working with their media people um, to uh, they tend to know who's who, who's better at that. And a lot of times, like at a large institution, let's say UCSF, they will work with some of the researchers to um, help them with that. But also a lot of doctors, um, they're used, especially those who deal directly with patients are not so much mired in the research. Um, some are just, they spend their lives explaining things to just regular people. So I find them to be um, often extremely adept at um, taking complicated issues and explaining them. Um, but, but very often you do need a guide if it's written in a very detailed uh, scientific way. Any thoughts, Samuel? I, I, I think, uh, yes, you, you want to read them um, and, and you'll need to read them in many cases. You know, I, I, there are articles that I read in the journal of the American Medical Association uh, and, and certainly Health Affairs is, a, is I think, an, an excellent journal, too. And, and Victoria's advice is correct. I mean, you ask to speak with the researcher and don't be afraid to ask questions that may sound dumb to you because, um, look, as I mentioned before, science is often about proving even the most basic things. And, and, and uh, as Victoria said, too, they're these are folks who spend their lives uh, uh, teaching and explaining. And if you're sincere in your in your desire to learn more about it, um, uh, they're they're gonna they're gonna uh, uh, respond to that, and and they will help guide you through uh, the, the 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 sort of academic dense journal articles that um, uh, you, you're gonna encounter sometimes. Uh, so that's my advice. And I'm gonna just chime in with a few little tips. Uh, one resource that's very valuable in this regard is Health News Review. For some of the kinds of things that you want to look for before you translate something, sometimes press releases will make claims that you won't find in the actual original study, even if they're put out by a mm -hmm. reputable university, they might be claiming that um, something could be cured. That's a word to watch out for, especially if it's a study mm -hmm. being done with mice, not humans. And so <laughs> there's a whole set of protocols um, on this. It's it's a hard topic to answer in a brief question here, but, but I think Health News Review has a lot of resources in this regard. Um, now we have a, a question from uh, Heather Mongolio, who sent this over the transom through our Twitter call out. She's from the Frederick News Post, and she asks, what advice do you have for reporting on sick children or children with sick parents? Hmm. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, children, sick children. I, I, look, I, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm too much into who pays for healthcare, but that really is one of the sort of central driving questions in all of healthcare. Uh, you know, it depends on how you want to approach it. You know, is it that you're interested in the particular illness that this child is struggling with, in which case you'll want to go to the experts in that? And, and speaking of, of sort of journal type resources, uh, PubMed is, is an excellent way to find uh, articles, research and studies that have been written on all different types of illnesses. Uh, if, if it's that you're interested in how, uh, how the parents cope with a child who, who has an illness, uh, everything from, uh, well, certainly you want to talk to that parent and find out. But, um, you know, I noticed that a lot of, lots of sort of support groups form on, in places like Facebook. And these folks will often sometimes uh, get help from a, a hospital social worker or someone who's 
trying to help them uh, sort of manage their child's disease and, 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 you know, make sure that they don't get burnt out in the process. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, to uh, uh, you know, who pays for it, uh, that can be pretty compelling storytelling too. Um, uh, so I, I hope that helps. Yeah, it's hard. I found parents to be actually really amazing advocates for, for their children. And very often, you know, do want to get that out there, um, and in the, you know, in a, in a way to basically educate others and to share their experience without exposing their child to, to too much. So that's that's my experience, by the way. We have a question from Nikki Ross, and it's very similar to these other ones about medical studies. How do you find researchers? And just to go back to the mention that Daniel made of PubMed, it's an archive of pretty much every medical study, and you can go in there and find studies by searching. And also, if you're writing on a study, you can find out who else does research in that topic, because you'll want to run somebody's mm -hmm. claims about their own research against someone who you know, didn't just feel very proud of what they're doing. Um, uh, we have a question from Art Levine, who says, outside of Googling Facebook under the topic you're researching, how do you find new victims to interview, especially if they don't have formal advocacy organizations representing them? And Victoria, you and I spoke earlier about your patient uh, files. Maybe you could talk about that. Well, very often, I, yeah, I would receive um, emails from patients about certain things. And I would, if I wasn't going to cover it right then, I would. would often um you know they would come up later and sometimes it took a lot of work like the whole story centers uh, very often centered around me getting the right patient and um i i, I can't emphasize that enough what I, usually there is some sort of advocacy group that could help you um i've done things like contacted people through twitter and and facebook um even like kind of ad hoc groups sometimes that works sometimes people found it a little creepy with that when i chime in just kind of um fly without some sort of introduction but other times they were fine so um rarely did i was i looking for something that had broader appeal that I couldn't find some group to use as my entry point, um, whether it's online or, or some other way. But that, yeah. I hope that helped. Yeah, I mean, my two cents is, where do the folks go for help? Um, I, you know, victims is, is kind of a, a, a broad term, but most folks who have been victimized seek help from someone or some agency or some institution, go to where they are. Uh, and, and, you know, if they're, if, if, if the side, like you said, from using Facebook and Google, uh, you know, actually visiting, uh, brick and mortar places, uh, where people turn to for help with, with whatever perhaps it is that they may be dealing with, uh, um, you know, those are, those tend to be, uh, good resources for that. And oftentimes, as Victoria said, there'll be advocates too. And maybe sometimes all you have is just a healthcare provider. Uh, you know, a doctor who's seen a lot of folks uh, with a particular type of uh, of, of condition, uh, and they can, you know, they can be a resource. And we have a question from Greta Mart. Um, and by the way, we're just going over for another couple of minutes because we have a, a few uh, remaining questions here. She says, may I ask you to flesh out mining the courthouse for health story tips on a statewide level? Is there a way I can look at all the lawsuits on a particular subject? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, look, uh, you know, I can tell you about Florida, and in Florida, the the courthouses uh, are 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 divided by circuit, uh, and I think there's like uh, 19 different circuits, and they tend to be by on the county level. But uh, frequently, there will be judicial associations, right? Uh, groups of lawyers who uh, um, uh, you know lobby and and gather this type of information. Uh, in Florida, there's the Florida Justice Association, and they mine all of the circuits, and they will compile data on malpractice lawsuits. Uh, but the problem I ran into that was that they lump all types of professional malpractice, not just medical, but also legal and 
I don't know, architects, et cetera, like that. But those folks can, can help you out. You, you know, what, what you, you often going to have to do is, is, at least in Florida, I'm not sure how it works in other states, is, is to look on the local level. Um, uh, that that's how that's how I would mine it. And oftentimes, uh, cases are filed by the type. So it will tell you if you're looking for, you know, medical malpractice, for instance, there is a case type that's, you know, has a, a code and, and that's the type of case. The other thing that's uh, also important to do is to talk to an expert in these areas. You know, in Florida, uh, before you file a, a suit against a doctor or a hospital, you're required to notify your Department of Health. Turn to the department. If once you know that, that that is on. Hey, guess what? They do actually have this information and, and they might have uh, the case numbers that you can go and search and it'll tell you where it is. So that's just some advice. Mm -hmm. So we'll take one last question. Um, this is from Julie Kochenderfer about strategies or tips for cold calling a potential source um, to speak on the records, uh, such as doctors mm -hmm. or other healthcare folks? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I found a lot of folks very open to speaking for the most part. Um, it, it, the hardest thing to me always is, is the patient part of it, because they're usually, even if you go to the, rock, the doctor, they use HIPAA, which isn't always um, as a shield, and it, sometimes they use it too much as a shield because they can just ask, and and if the if the person agrees, they can they have to sign some papers, and and they'll talk to you. But um, I, in terms of like cold calling, you know, sometimes I I send an email first, I introduce myself, um, kind of give them lay of the land, bef um, and you know, I'm surprised at how many warm responses I get back usually. And, and then you set up a time to meet with that person if that works. Um, uh, like I said, researchers and people in the, in the industry, I've always found, unless they're just someone who just doesn't like to deal with the press, pretty pretty open. Um, and it, it, the trickiest thing is always getting patients willing to talk about the two issues that are kind of almost taboo, their health and their money. And then getting a picture of them and putting them in a, um, a newspaper is always a, a fun fun challenge. Yeah, those are challenging. And I, I, I think that you need to be sincere about uh, why you're calling them. And they need, to, they need to know that from you. But I think you also want to consider, well, who is it that you're calling and what motivates them? And a lot of folks who are in healthcare are in it to help other people. And if you can appeal to that sense of them, that, you know, that, that, that responsibility that they have, oftentimes you can get somebody who's never met you and doesn't know you from Adam to open up a little bit. And I would also say, you know, it's called cold calling, but look, I mean, you can cold call them and say something along the lines of, you know, we have things in co we have interests in common. I know that you want to help others and, and that's, you know, part of why you do. Let's meet for coffee. You know, um, or, or, you know, if you're going to be at this meeting, I'd like to just introduce myself for five minutes. And in person, you know, a cold call can turn into a quick or a brief in-person meeting in which you can also, you know, uh, sort of use your powers of persuasion. So. Well, I'm really appreciative of these tips and this wisdom from these two veteran reporters. And um, for those of you who have been on the call, please know that we are going to be archiving both the PowerPoint presentations and the entire video of this webinar on JenniferHealthJournalism.org. Uh, please check out our other resources as well. In a moment, we'll be sending you, or in a little bit, a survey that um, asks for your feedback on this webinar and on what topics you would be most interested in for future webinars. We urge you to complete it. Uh, this is all for you, and we also want to thank our funders for so generously supporting this work. Have a wonderful day. This is Michelle Levander. Thanks, Michelle.